Thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. How are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Excellent. I, I have to tell you, by the way, I, I love the artwork you have behind you. It's uh, certainly better than my backdrop. So, <laughs> get a bunch of young kids. This is every day. <laughs> every day in preschool, I get sort of a new piece of art, which is nice. But at some point, the wall will get full, and then I have to start curating, which feels a little judgy for a yeah. preschooler who's making art. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. I mean, we were just chatting a little bit. I heard about you a little while ago. Excited that we were finally able to connect to get you on here. I'd love if you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself, and we can get things started. Awesome. Um, so you know, most of my background is in consumer tech. I started as both a designer and an engineer 15 plus years ago, but being able to build my own digital products meant I was, I guess for better or worse, I didn't have to convince somebody else to help me build something. And so a bunch of ideas that maybe shouldn't have got built, got built because I could just build them myself. One of them unintentionally was this hot or not for color, do I think your uh, sweater choice here is a very attractive color, somebody else doesn't. And it was just this playground for color and color combinations. In hindsight, it really became a utility for designers because they could come and just get a shortcut. Ah, this color goes with these and they went back to work. But for others, it was a creative outlet where there really wasn't a skill required to join. So what I learned most about that company is I was sort of good at building empathetic communities. Color Lovers became a five-time Webby nominee for best community. It had several million visitors at its prime. It was never really clear what the business of that company was. Uh, we tried monetizing color data and it just didn't really work. But over we got into Y Combinator in uh, winter 2010. I had no other pedigrees that opened doors for me. So when I sort of was able to move to San Francisco and get into YC. It was this real big catalyst for my career of like, oh, this is how you talk to investors and this is what we're supposed to be doing. And what we saw was we were just trying to make design simple and accessible. And the best way that we could do that was to build a marketplace that was the best all-in-one digital creative Etsy-like marketplace where if you produce fonts, like, great, I'm, I might be trying to buy a keynote theme for a presentation, likely I'm gonna want some fonts and some photos and other things to go with it and every other marketplace was fragmented. So. We built Creative Market on top of this design audience. It was the overnight success acquired 11 months after launch, you know, at the back of my nine years struggling through this very random color community I was trying to sort of build and figure out. Um, but it meant in 2014, we were acquired by Autodesk. It was a life-changing outcome for, you know, us and the team, go to return for our investors. And around the same time, uh, my best friend who I'd worked for as a web engineer when I first got started in my career, had built template websites for eye doctor offices. His uh, father's an optometrist, sister's an optometrist, and they built these template websites that were not particularly, no offense, great website templates, but inside of it was an e-commerce engine that let people order contact lenses. And this 2014 Dollar Shave Club is sort of you know on a big trajectory here. It's like, man, it, this website builder is kind of clunky, but the whole faxes and everything that has to get sent for prescription to order contacts is, this is great. Like, let's build a direct to consumer brand here for contact lenses. Um, so I helped Travis start Sightbox. I was a lot of the initial UI, UX, and brand. To his credit, he ran that company very well. It was acquired by Johnson and Johnson in 2017. So I guess it's like nine years on the first, pretty quick on the second. I'm getting better at product market fit, or at least understanding what is. So, well, how do I get closer to the transaction in these in these things? So um, that had happened in 2017. You get in the full life story here. My uh, wife and I are both born and raised in Hawaii. And after the 2014 uh, acquisition, we'd moved home to Hawaii to build our dream home in our hometown, thinking we'd like, you know, build the the permanent home that kids grow up in. And I got four years into that life and then ended up depressed, which is a hard thing, honestly, to realize when you're, I have a very privileged life, but it's like, man, why I have every reason to feel good. Why do I feel terrible today? Like I just, it was, wasn't a good, there wasn't a joy. Um, granted, I, I will say I have very, you know, often moments of joy with my family, but it was just something that just happened and then it went away. And it took time to realize that for better or worse, I'm I'm most fulfilled by the crazy stress and challenges of building a company. Like unless I'm getting pushed to my limits and then forced to grow, you know, just unfortunately it's it's not fulfilling for me. So my very supportive wife, uh, I said, look, I think we built our dream life in Hawaii, but I I can move us back to the West Coast. Like I'm just not doing well. And we had been previously in the Bay Area, but family was in Portland, Oregon. It's like, look, let's just go a little bit more family oriented community. Let's move to Portland and I'll see if, you know, I can find 
more happiness for myself. And uh, Portland did what we wanted to do. It was a great place for the kids. Um, I, I felt good there and then I felt inspired again. And then Brave Care came out of my middle daughter splitting her chin at a bike park. She just sailed off a ramp and landed on her face. It's the first emergency experience we had with any of our kids and the face is a, is a bleeder. So it was a, uh, you know, a painful experience, but you know, it's like, I knew stitches were coming. It wasn't as, it wasn't a scary event. It was just like, you know, okay, we got to do this stuff. And we were across town. So I had no idea what hospital or care facility was nearby. I was handed a flyer at the front desk for a pediatric urgent care on the drive over. I was going through this, you know, I've been to urgent cares myself. I don't think it's a particularly great experience, but I've also been to the ER and I really didn't want to take my five-year-old to the emergency department. And so ended up at this kid only urgent care and I was happy with it. This, the environment was sort of designed for our age demographic. It felt modern and clean. The providers were awesome with kids. It was like, great. Um, you know, we, we had a, what I'd call a good visit given, you know, the situation that we were in. And then the next weekend, almost seven days later, my one-year-old had croup with Schrider. Didn't know what either of those were at the time when it happened, but it means my one-year-old really couldn't breathe. And my wife was out of town both weekends. So I'm going through all of this pain is what single parents go through. Nobody to talk you on or off a cliff or to just support while you're trying to deal with these things. Um, I say this often, being a parent is the most important job I've ever had, that I have no training or qualifications to have this job. It's also the one that I really want to do the best at, which almost, you know, it's consistent state of anxiety, fear, imposter syndrome. I just was laughing last night about like, I don't not, I was, my wife is out of, out of town as well. I'm not qualified to be raising these three kids. Like I don't have qualifications for this, but I care a lot about it, um, which sort of reinforces this constant state of fear and unknowing. But I, I took my one-year-old back to the same clinic because I had gotten great care the first time and then spent almost three hours there, not because the care was bad or that I had a long wait, is that they were attentive and thoughtful. It was she inhaled the steroid to get the esophagus to relax and the doctor saying like, look, she's on the cusp. She's OK. I'm OK if you're OK. Like, we've got time. If I have to give you a second dose, she's going to the emergency department. And you got to be there for 24 hours. So it's like, I don't want to do that. And they just appreciated that he gave me the space. Um, it was a little uncomfortable holding my two-year-old uh, for a couple hours. So he gave me his office chair and I basically sat there for a couple hours. And through that experience, it really was like scary for me. I mean, this is, I think, what often parents have felt in these situations that were more emergency care for the kids. I, there's nothing I can do. Like I have no ability to help this, the most important thing for me. And just like, the other thing I've done for the last few years is worked a lot with the Make-A-Wish Foundation because it's like the heaviest thing I can process as a parent. And I wasn't even to that level, but I spent two hours in that beginning state of that, oh my God, I'm so vulnerable here and there's nothing I can do for my kid. So coming out of the second visit, it was like perfectly traumatic for me of like, well, obviously whatever I build next, I should build something for kids. I, as by the art, I number one thing I love is being a dad and having young kids. I'm on the board of the Montessori preschool. I'd rather sit at the kids table rather than the adult table at a dinner. Like it's, obviously I should just go do something for kids. And when I was leaving the clinic the second time, the doctor had said, hey, you know, there's this kind of traction. You got to look at a rib. I'm like, dude, I don't want to know what that is. I'm not responsible for that. You give me your cell phone number and I'll just call or text you if I have a question. So I had left with Dr. Corey Fish, my now co-founder's phone number. And I like text a day later of like, I, I think I'm pretty good at building good consumer experiences. I'm a parent. I feel this one personally. Could I just meet you for coffee? I want to ask you a hundred questions about the space. What I learned really quickly is that in terms of founder dynamics, I, tr I trust him with the life of my child. I don't have a higher level of trust than that. And for Corey, he had started this uh, urgent care because he had done primary care for a couple of years and found that they were referring parents to the emergency department after hours more frequently than they really should be like the kid didn't need emergency care at that level it was that there was no other option available 7 p.m on a saturday and so he had enough entrepreneurial drive to say i'm gonna go start this clinic on my own and had run it for about a year when we met it turns out to be sort of the perfect time for him to go like dang this is really hard to be the doctor doing the care and trying to run a business so it's just perfect opportunity for us to join and where we started i mean the thing that i heard the loudest from him in that first coffee meeting was 
that there are 25 million ER visits a year for kids. Nearly all of those are not life-threatening. That's not the appropriate level of care. And it's not, it makes the ER overutilized instead of being, you know, the right care for other people. So, and the, what I would have gotten from the emergency department is 10 times as much as I spent at what is now our first brave care clinic. The same procedures that we do, the ER bills 10 times as much for. And I think we're a better experience because the quality is oriented for, for kids. It's a, you know, quieter, safer, more peaceful environment for them. So where we started at the beginning of last year was, well, let's, uh, you know, scale pediatric urgent care. Let's make it so that tens of millions of those visits can go to a better care facility at one tenth the cost. Um, and we had basically just kind of raised the pre-seed round the beginning of last year, got into Y Combinator's summer 19 batch. It's almost exactly 10 years later for me. And what I think was the most valuable thing out of the second experience was well, I see a lot is uh, one hacker culture, which just means non-obvious solution to complex problems. That's what they mean by a hack. And you know, what's this biggest version of what you're working on? And what we really came to was we just wanted to be the best healthcare for a kid. You, you know, simplify the message. If it's life threatening, you should go to the emergency department. But for all other care, we can be your your partner in this. So to move to do primary and urgent and remote care, it's all built on the same company. We, once you establish trust, you can trust us across that spectrum. And the challenges of that would be building a really great user experience. What we'd say internally is like we didn't build an app and it's not our clinic, it's our product. Our product is a patient experience, both for parent and child across any interaction with us. An in-person visit, uh, a telehealth visit, a phone call at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, all of those should feel like you're talking to the same person or that you're connected in the same way. Um, so we started building that. We took over this first clinic that I had gone into as a parent. Uh, it became our first Brave Care clinic. We just opened our second clinic in Portland. Uh, we turned on our primary care. We built the all of the software that runs the clinics, so, you know, multi-location, multi-modes of care, and built the consumer app and all of the sort of a telehealth product that extends the reach of where our physical clinics are. And I think the nuance for us of how we think about telehealth, because it's having its moment with COVID, you know, people can't go anywhere. So we're leaning on technology to, to get us there. The challenge in pediatrics is one, it's the, it's kind of the philosophical way we approach telehealth as, as an adult or as a child. As an adult, I'm generally like going to the doctor to make sure I'm not dying, but I'm not doing a lot of proactive well care, not doing a lot of preventative. I think I'm fairly healthy, but it's just the, the way I think about getting care. So if I think my back hurts or my rib, I'm gonna do a telehealth appointment near my doc. And I'm like, it's it's probably, I don't know, it's like three ribs down. There's kind of a sharp pain here. And I feel the most pain in it, it like 90% of a full breath is where I feel it. You might be able to do good diagnosis and treatment based on the precision of language I'm using to explain what's hurting. My, who just came in the room, second, my eight-year-old is not gonna be able to do that. Five-year-old, surely not. Three-year-old, not a chance. So if you can't get precision information out, then you, you kind of need to do hands-on bodies manipulation. A good pediatrician knows, oh, it's referral pain. Let me push here. How does this feel? Um, so it's limited, I think, the, the really quality of care you can do pediatrics uh, through telehealth. We did a cursory look at about, I think, several hundred of our 4,000 visits. 80% had to be done in clinic because it required a breathing treatment, a shot, a stitch, a lab, an x-ray, just something that, I mean, even really good dongles, I'm not going to do, uh, you know, that kind of care through telehealth. And then the vast majority of well visits are vaccine visits. Um, those aren't going to get done remotely either. So the goal for us is build the best in-clinic care experience that is leveraged, driven efficiently through technology, and then using that platform to enable anybody anywhere to connect to this pediatric expertise we have in all of our clinics. Really interesting. I, I like the best, the best uh, startup stories that I hear, right, are the ones that have that personal. So, I mean, you, you have a mix of everything, right? It, it hits upon um, you wanting to be a good father to, to your children, um, your creativity. Um, I, I really like that whole explanation and the whole story about how you got to where you are today and and what brave care represents how did things get affected positively negatively based on what happened with covid this year um it's mostly negative although i think there's positives in it um 
it, it's dramatically impacted our patient visit. So, you know, we were on this great trajectory. We'd gotten the first clinic profitable. We're into our margins. And then I guess that'd be March would have been the busiest month we ever had. You get about two and a half weeks into March and it just dropped. And there's two reasons for it. One, it's like during the school year, I got three kids in three different schools. We have colds almost year round in our house. There's little viral traps going to different, you know, virus pools and coming home. And so when kids just sort of like got home locked, they weren't getting sick as much, but they're also not going outside as much. One of the, you know, part of the reason Brave is in our name is that we believe it's a healthy part of a child's development to get sick and injured. You get injured because you're pushing yourself physically, you're growing and you're learning, your coordination, and you get sick because you're exposing yourself to a lot of other people, ideas, you know, it's where you learn, go to museums and things. So when you sort of restrict exposure to other people and climbing trees, perhaps just fewer kids were getting sick. Or the other thing we saw is that the level of acuity for those visits, when I mean, we had more kind of life-threatening cases come in than we'd had in the first year before that, because parents were waiting too long. You know, there was signals that things were getting bad and they just felt so uncomfortable they weren't going. So our overall visit volumes dropped pretty dramatically. Um, the way that we thought, the sort of forecasting what we thought COVID would do to us was to drop expected patients visits down to about 25% for four months, 50 for four months, 75 for four months. So a one year resuming, because the cadence of care won't change in pediatrics is childhood developmental milestones. Like we sort of needed to do it at that cadence. It's just, what will that care look like when we get there? Um, we've been pretty close to that projection. We've, we've beat it. Um, what our forecast was, but it meant us going, man, this is going to be pretty brutal for a whole year. Um, we've seen their numbers come back. We're in a better position. Uh, flu season is coming back. Uh, well, preventative flu shots are coming back strong this year because people are more concerned about it. Um, we stayed open the whole time. So the good of what we do is I feel, again, this is, um, it's mission aligned for me. We deliver really meaningful care. Like that feels good to me. So even if business is getting hammered, parents knowing that they can go somewhere that's safe in this environment where they can get COVID tests. We now do the rapid COVID test. So if your toddler's got a runny nose, let me go find out that's a negative so my kid can go back to school in a day instead of waiting seven days, which is an impact on the family. Um, providing that meaningful care in the way that we do it um, has been great for us to stay open. Um, and so I think, you know, we're on this recovery track, um, but it has definitely impacted the business. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see a lot of that happening. I, I can definitely see the parents not wanting to maybe act on things as soon as they would in the past because they themselves don't want to go out, right? Um, yeah. Especially, I was always, uh, I mean, I'm always worried, right? Like, if I'm not feeling well, sometimes I'll be like, do I want to go into the, I, like, I really want to be bad enough, even though this probably isn't the best way to look at it, right, to go in yeah. there because what if I don't have anything and then I'm exposing myself, right? So I'm sure that's part of their thought process too. Yeah, and that's part of educating our parents um, and, and thinking through how we build our user experiences. So the difference between us and maybe a standard primary care provider is they're often not set up to have very sick kids come in. If you're predominantly doing well care, kids are well when they come in. We, because we do also urgent care, expect kids with like really bad flus and everything. So, you know, our cleanliness procedures, the way that we isolate, like we're sort of fine. We're even enabled ourselves to be able to have COVID cases come in. We obviously take extra precautions now. There's, you know, more significant PPE. We do our COVID tests in the parking lot when we can. So, you know, it's just to further minimize the risk for everybody. The other thing is we just built our second clinic. And this one we built up sort of as a brave care from the ground up. Our waiting room is purposely small. Like we hand you an iPad when you check in so you can go to one of the visit rooms. We get You get more visit rooms if you give up a huge waiting room. Nobody wants to sit in the lobby with all the other sick people. So our goal is I'm going to just get you roomed as fast as possible. You check in on the iPad. It's really nice. And it just tells us when you're done. So people, somebody can immediately come in because the system is all connected. Um, so some of it is just educating parents that you can come in. It's a safe, comfortable environment. You're not sitting with a lot of other sick people, you know, our HVAC system pulls and cleans the air that comes through the clinic, just, you know, things like that. Interesting. Where, where can people learn more about you and Brave Care? Uh, I mean, everything's on our site at bravecare.com. Um, we have a 24 hour nurse line for parents that are worried and you know, have a question at 2 a.m. if they can't reach their own person. Um, we try to be a resource for people, even in markets we're not necessarily there yet. 
um, at the root of what we're doing. Uh, you mentioned it. I, uh, this matters a lot to me. I'm a regular customer of our own company uh, with three young kids. They're getting sick and hurt all the time. And I know how good that feels to know that, you know, I have somebody I can trust. Um, we don't charge a membership for primary care. We're not uh, targeted at more affluent individuals that have discretionary income. Everybody deserves the high quality of care my kids get, regardless of you know what their finances are. Um, so the long-term play is to be the best national healthcare company for children's health, but you could get started at bravecare.com. Perfect, and I'll throw that in the, in the show notes so everyone will be able to go directly there. Perfect. Well, Darius, again, thanks so much for, for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. Look forward to staying in touch and, and following uh, your journey and, and Brave Cares. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks.